So, we're talking about sustainable happiness tonight, and some of you may be wondering, if you're paying attention, how can we talk about happiness during such dire times? Because one of the things we do at Yes Magazine, we talk about solutions, but we do it with a, with a deep awareness that we're in seriously troubled times. So just a few thoughts on that. And then, you know, a lot of books you read, they start off, they go like 90% the problem, and then they get to the end and they say, but we're gonna do something about it, we're gonna solve it. Well, we try to flip that on its head. We try to, when we do Yes Magazine, we, we talk about the problem for, for the first maybe 10% of the magazine. And then we, we give 90% to the solutions. So we're gonna do that again tonight. So don't get discouraged if I, <laughs> if I start off with some bad news. So where I live near Seattle, the ocean waters are getting acidified. What that means is that oysters and clams are having difficulty creating the shells that they need to survive. It means that the plankton at the bottom of the food chain are dying. And we don't know why, but starfish that used to be all over the shores of Puget Sound and the oceans suddenly have become ill and have died and they've disappeared. There's very few of them left. They don't know if that's caused by ocean acidification or warmer temperatures but they're dying. If you look what's going on in California, California is you're seeing uh, sea lion pups washing up on the shores of the beaches. They're evidently starving. The ocean temperatures are five degrees warmer, which is changing the whole, mech the whole marine biology. The parents aren't able to get, bring the food to the pups, and they're washing up on the beach. Here in the, northwest, uh, the Northeast, I know you've had a very cold winter maybe related to the changes in the jet stream that comes about when the, when the very north is warmer than it used to be. And so the, the, the cycles of the jet stream that used to be fairly stable have now become much more uneven. Maybe that's related, maybe not, we don't really know. But maybe you're thinking about moving to Florida. <laughs> well, in Florida, the highest point is about 400 feet and they're starting to get saltwater incursions into the fresh water. But they have a solution that other people haven't thought of yet, which is to prohibit anyone in state government from using the term climate change in any official documents. So no worries about that. <clears throat> so these are tough times. These are times when we're looking at the sixth major extinction of species that have taken place since the beginning of the planet Earth, the only extinction that's caused by human beings. It's a question that a lot of, I think, young people and people who have children and grandchildren ask themselves is what kind of world will the next generations be growing up in? And there's also, you know, the, one, of the, one of the issues that I think a lot of us have been concerned about for many years, the issue of peace, also turns out to be related to the climate crisis. There's a new finding in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that says climate-induced changes helped to lead to the upheavals in Syria, which have now caused civil war and brought about enormous suffering and, and the loss of lives of, of millions of people. So in all fairness, shouldn't we be agonizing about these issues instead of talking about happiness if we were responsible? Shouldn't, we, shouldn't that be what we focus our time on? Well, these are issues that are dire and urgent, but our feeling is that part of the solution even for things as troubling as this, is to look deeply at the culture that allows these kinds of things to take place. Because one of the things that's happened in our culture is our notion of happiness has been hijacked. We've been told that we cannot be happy unless we have a certain amount of stuff, unless we have large quantities of stuff, and it has to be the right stuff. And that whole culture that is focused around consumerism, around materialism, as the source of happiness, that is part of what gives, what provides the foundation for the kind of a society and the kind of economy that can be so extractive, that can use up so many of the planet's resources, and that can also be so devastating for so many of the poor workers who end up creating all of that cheap stuff. So I want to lay that out a little bit in a little bit more detail and then talk about, well, if that's not the source of happiness, and it, in our findings it is not, 
What is a real source of happiness? And is there a source of happiness that could actually sustain our well-being and sustain the planet and be far more just? And our, our belief, of course, is that there is. So I want to ask if you would start by thinking of a moment when you have felt especially happy. Just imagine a moment where you felt just, just soulfully content, just deeply happy. And let that settle in and think about what you were doing during that moment and who you were with and what you were seeing around you. And I'd like to ask you to take just a moment to share that moment with one or two other people who are sitting right around you. Just, just take a moment to tell the person next to you um, or behind you just something about that moment. So let me ask you a question. How many of you had an experience when you were imagining that moment? How many of you were experiencing something in nature? Raise your hand if that was part of your experience. And how many of you were with a loved one or a dear friend? Raise your hand if that was part of your experience. And I want to ask you this because I don't want to put you on the spot, but anybody, anybody at the shopping mall? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So how did our society come to, sh to believe that consuming and owning and having more stuff would be at the center of happiness? How did we come to have that view? Well, first off, there is a grain of truth in the stuff equals happiness formulation. The grain of truth is that if you're poor, if you don't have enough, enough to eat, a roof over your head, then having stuff really does bring about happiness, okay? There's a big difference from being homeless and having a home. There's a big difference not knowing when, how you're gonna feed your children and knowing how you're gonna feed your children. And that brings about real well-being and real happiness. But the science shows us that after a certain point of, well, of wealth, of income, more income does not bring about more happiness. After you get to the point of having a secure middle class level of economic existence, more stuff doesn't bring more happiness. What the research does show us is that in, in a highly unequal society, we have less well-being. There's a wonderful author by the name of Richard Wilkinson, who's an epidemiologist, and he was doing research that he expected to show that po impoverished societies were less happy and wealthy societies were happier. And he found there wasn't a strong correlation. What he found was that there was a strong correlation between unequal societies and unhappiness, and equitable societies and more happiness. So he, he was kind of puzzled by that because it wasn't what he expected to find. So he started looking into it, and he found that in more equitable societies, there's higher levels of trust. People know that they can count on one another. There's a sense that if you make a mistake, you're not going to fall off the edge into homelessness, for example. The way that in this country we now have that fear. So many people in the middle class just don't know if they're one pink slip away from homelessness, one major illness away from homelessness. Really terrifying kinds of things to contemplate. In more equitable societies, that tends not to be the case so much. And what he found was that there's higher rates of mental illness, there's higher rates of suicide, lower life expectancy, lower trust. And when he added it all up, it turns out that inequality is more toxic to our health than smoking cigarettes. It has this big effect on our life expectancy. So fairness is actually correlated with happiness, not stuff. So how does stuff come to be so central to our lives. In the book, we have a section we call A Brief History of Happiness. It's very brief. We went back to the 1930s, and there was a period when business leaders and government leaders were worried that Americans basically had enough stuff, that they were going to quit buying so much. They were basically satiated. They had the basics, and they, they didn't necessarily want to keep buying anymore. So there are two directions that could have gone at that point. One direction would have said, well, if we've got enough, let's, let's divide up the work that there is, and let's spend a lot of our time doing something else besides working. And one can imagine what that could involve. It could involve spending more time with your kids, or taking care of elderly parents, or it could involve a spiritual practice, or it could involve writing a book, or reading more books, or taking up a hobby, or spending time in your community helping to 
to make the community a better place, or gardening, or th there's so many things one can imagine, and we almost can't imagine anymore because we've been so time-starved in this country. But if we had more time as part of our ordinary life, our families and our communities could be so much richer. And there actually turned out to be one example of a place that did go in that direction. That was Battle Creek, Michigan, where the Kellogg Company decided in 1930 to divide up their 24-hour shifts instead of three ways, three eight-hour shifts, they divided them into four six-hour shifts. So suddenly they were able to put a lot more people to work, which was one of the reasons they did that since it was during the Depression. But they were also able to release a lot of time. And the, the productivity was so high, they actually ended up being able to pay people as much for a six-hour shift as they had been paying for an eight-hour shift. And the report by Benjamin Honeycutt, who's a professor of leisure studies, who's written a whole book on this, the report that he did indicates that the entire community started flowering. People had more time to volunteer. They had more time with their kids. The women especially loved it because all of these things that they wanted to be able to do around the home, they were able to do. So there is this flowering of the community of civic engagement, of clubs, of hobbies. The, the experiment actually continued until 1985 but it was going against the grain because really no one else was doing that. The mainstream decision, the main decision was instead of cutting back on work time, we will increase the amount that people buy. And how will we do that? This was right around the time that Freudian psychology was becoming very popular. The solution was to link people's deepest desires, our yearning for love, for acceptance and status and yearning for sex, for family life, everything was linked to buying. And that was the birth of the modern advertising industry, which has been enormously successful on its own terms. It's, it's involved spending billions of dollars to convince us that the ways to have these things that are so intrinsic to our well-being is through what we own, is what through, through what we buy. And there's a lot of implications to that. Actually, let me just give you a quote from Herbert Hoover, who was one of the people that was, uh, was very in favor of this approach. He said, wants are almost insatiable. We have a boundless field before us. There are new wants that will make way endlessly for newer wants. Wants and needs can be constantly stirred up. So billions of dollars have been spent on that story. And, and uh, George Gerbner, who's a communications theorist, says those who control the story of a culture control behavior. And advertisers have been controlling the story. But in reality, we know what consumerism does to our personal lives. One thing it does is it tends to get people into debt. We, we hear about all these things we absolutely must have to be accepted by our peers, to be able to move ahead in our careers, to be able to find a lover or spouse, and we go out and buy those things, and then we go in above, over our heads, we end up in credit card debt with all the interest that that implies. We end up in this work and debt cycle, because then we have to work more to pay off all that debt. And then we find ourselves stressed out and exhausted. And when we're starting to feel bad and stressed out, advertisers have a solution for that too, which is go out and buy some more stuff and you'll feel better. You'll get that little buyer's high. So it's this cycle. Consume, work, spend, consume, work, spend. And stress and lack of time are, are built right in and the things that actually could nourish us and, and reduce stress, like spending time with our family and the people we love. We don't have time for that because we're too busy in that cycle. All that consumerism also means we're using up the natural resources of the planet at a tremendous rate. We have to extract all that stuff from Mother Nature, from the trees, from, the, from mining, all those natural resources that go into creating all that stuff. And we have to get rid of the waste afterwards because a lot of that stuff is built very cheap and, it's gonna, and it uses, gets used up quickly and it has to go right back into the planet. So that's where, where the waste products from all that production is part of what's contributing to climate change. It's all that carbon dioxide from transporting and producing stuff. It's going into the oceans in the form of, uh, of effluents and creating dead zones. You, you know that story, so I'm not going to go any further into that. So we know that consumerism isn't bringing us more happiness and it's not doing much for the planet, but what about economic growth, right? That's the last argument when you bring this up. People say, 
You know what? The American consumer has got to keep consuming because otherwise the economy will stall. That old argument from the 1930s, it's still brought up. It's what George W. Bush told us to do after 9-11 was to go shop, keep the engine going. So does consumerism, in fact, contribute to economic gro growth? Well, it does. But the economic growth does not contribute to our well-being. Perhaps it was in the past, up until around the 1970s, the growth in the economy, the growth in the GDP, and the growth in another indicator called the Genuine Progress Indicator went sort of in lockstep. Both were increasing, right? We were, as the economy was growing, people, there was widespread distribution of the benefits of the economy. People were getting homes. They were, their um, standard of living was going up. Back, I don't know if you, you all who are more like my age remember that one person who was a factory worker could support a whole family. At, at, at a reasonable middle class way of life and, and put their kids through college. So there was a broader sharing of the benefits of economic growth. But then something happened right around the Reagan administration. One thing that happened was that in the, in the past, the tax rate, tax rate for the highest income people had been quite high under the Eisenhower administration. The marginal tax rate was about 94%. So that was keeping things much more widely distributed. Another thing, and under, under Reagan, as you remember, there were those huge tax cuts for the, for the most wealthy. Another thing that happened was a clampdown on labor unions. So that in the past, union workers had been able to negotiate for a larger share of the benefits of all that economic activity. With the Reagan administration, there was, as you may recall, the air traffic controllers strike. There was a clampdown on unions, and unions have been on the decline ever since. So working people have had less ability to negotiate for some larger, some share of those, of those um, profits and the increase in productivity. And then the third major thing was the trade agreements, like NAFTA, which meant that the borders were open to production to happen anywhere in the world, which means corporations could easily move jobs to the lowest wage countries, Mexico and China, and then when wages were too high there, they could move on to other places like Vietnam and Thailand in a sort of a global race to the bottom for wages. In fact, I have a, a friend who was a small business owner who made lighting fixtures, and, and um, he was, he, one of his big customers was Walmart, and Walmart essentially told him, if you don't move production to China, you can't supply us anymore because there's no way you can bring your prices low enough if you keep producing in the United States. So he went out of business. So that's the kind of dynamic we've been seeing is the, the uh, great number of jobs that go overseas, the jobs that stay, it's become harder to, for people to maintain a living wage for those jobs. So as economic growth has continued since the 1970s, the genuine progress indicator has gotten flat. Those benefits are not being shared with ordinary people. So it turns out consumerism doesn't deliver economic benefit, at least not for the 99.9%. It doesn't deliver happiness. And it does, doesn't deliver a sustainable planet. So when you have a lose, lose, lose proposition, the good news is there's a lot of room for improvement. We could actually shift some things and end up with a win, win, win situation. And that's what, what I think can happen if we can take back, reclaim the notion of happiness, if we can essentially decolonize happiness, you could think of happiness as having been colonized for the purposes of large corporations to sell us stuff. If we can decolonize that and take back our own view of happiness, then we can get free of that. So what does bring real happiness? We need to define that ourselves. We can't just say it's not stuff. What is it? Well, it turns out a lot of what the research tells us brings about happiness are the things your grandmother probably told you, things like count your blessings. They're simple things. They're about gratitude, about paying attention to the things that have happened to you over the course of a day that made you feel good, that made you happy, that you appreciate. Some people do a gratitude journal. They actually write notes to pay attention to those things, because it's so easy in a stress-filled society to only, only think about the things that were stressful or that were frightening or that were, made us angry. 
but you can actually switch the wiring of your brain, switch the whole way in which your stress hormones are coursing through your body by choosing to pay attention to the things that brought you happiness. Another practice some people use is a, ha is a gratitude letter where they write a letter to somebody, it could have been from years ago, who did something that they appreciate. It could have been a mentor, it could have been grandmother, it could be anybody who's contributed something of value to you. And when you write the letter, the research has shown that the person who writes the letter feels better for weeks afterwards. And of course, the person who got the letter can be pretty happy too. So gratitude is one thing that's, that's, uh, that's a, clearly a source of happiness. Another is mindfulness, and there's lots of different variations on this. The, the term comes out of Buddhism, but I think every spiritual practice has some variation on it. In the book, we have a quote from Matteo Ricard who talks about, um, actually we have a whole chapter by him, which is one of my favorite chapters. He talks about <clears throat> the benefit of resting in pure awareness of the present moment and then referring to that moment when afflictive emotions come about. So if you make that a practice, you can actually have that place that you can return to, just like we were talking earlier about times when you felt that kind of happiness. You can have that as a place to go to when you start feeling yourself triggered. And he talks about how many people, when they think about what their most joyful moment is, they think of something like walking on a beach or looking up at the stars. And he said, you know, what, what is it about those moments? Well, those are moments when we're not thinking about the past, we're not thinking, regretting something that happened before, or chewing over an argument we had, or is, we're not thinking about the future, we're not worrying about what's to come, we're in the present moment. We're just in the present moment, it, often in nature, often with somebody we love, but not always. It can be in, in any situation. So those are practices that are available to any of us and they don't cost us any money and they don't cost the earth. There's an article in the, in, the, um, in the book about tech Sabbaths, about taking a day every week when you put down your screens, you don't look at the computer, you don't look at your phone, you just pay attention to the people around you. And one of, uh, one of the cafes I visited in, in Oakland, California during this book tour, actually does that. They have a day a week when they ask people to not open their laptops and to do the things that people used to do in cafes, which is to talk, talk to the people around them. And that's where revolutions used to get started, right? People would go to the cafes and they'd be talking and pretty soon a lot of more talking and pretty soon they'd have a revolution. So um, those, are some, those are some of the practices and there's more in the book as well and, uh, that, are, that are things that you can do on your own. But real sustainable happiness isn't only an inside job, okay? I mean, a lot of, a lot of the happiness books that are out there that are, that are more in the self-help genre basically say you can do it all yourself. Our view is that it's also a social question. It's also a question of the kind of society, the kind of community that we build. And one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot lately, and in fact, we were talking about over dinner, is the role that trauma has in our sense of well-being. Because there's many people in our society who have been deeply traumatized by things over which they had no control. For example, the figures are all over the place, but something like a quarter of kids have been abused or neglected seriously over the course of their lives. And when that happens, they, they live with the repercussions of that for many years. There's, there, are, there are certainly therapies out there, but those are, that's, a, that's a major impediment to a sense of well-being on the part of a lot of, a lot of people. And again, that, to me, that also gets, raises a question of community because in a, in a tight-knit community or extended family, if one set of parents are not doing what a child needs, there are often other adults to step in, to help out, to be that, that person who loves and cares for that child. Another population is veterans, who are now, of course, are coming back from a, a long period of, of deep trauma as part of their military service. Uh, according to the Veterans Department of Veterans Affairs, 30% of those who are treated in VA hospitals have some form of PTSD. Another po population is people of color who have been subjected to racial exclusion, to violence, to a long history that goes back to a history of slavery that we don't like to acknowledge in this country because we like to think of it as something that is long past. 
But in fact, slavery morphed into the era of Jim Crow and into uh, mass lynchings. I don't know if you saw the recent report out that 4,000 people were, were documented to have been lynched during that period of Reconstruction. And then to a period of, of exclusion, economic exclusion so that uh, the ability to create a secure existence for a family was also undermined. And continued violence, um, as we're seeing today with the Black Lives Matter movement, continued violence on the part of police. So there are many different populations that are especially challenged when it comes to happiness. And in many cases, those are the responsibility of all of us in a community to work to heal and alleviate the causes of those forms of trauma. A third category is the way that we build our families and communities. We're hardwired for cooperation. We, we evolved as people in families. We, we are born into the world naked with nothing but love to count on. So this is something that's deeply part of who we are, is the, the desire to be with a community of people, to be loved and to be held in a family. And fewer than half of Americans actually have a family dinner over the course of a week. I'm sorry, have a daily family dinner. So one of the simple things people can do is simply have dinner with the family. And the research shows that children who are brought up in families where there's a family dinner tend to have much greater emotional resilience and emotional intelligence. And it's interesting, you know, when you look at, the, at what people say at the end of their lives, the things that they regret, very few of them wish that they had had the right pair of sneakers or the right car, but many of them will say, I wish I had taken the time for that deeper conversation with my father or with my daughter, or I wish I'd had more time just to hang out with my friends. So those are things that are, are really clearly part of how we achieve happiness. That one of my favorite chapters in the book is written by Peter Block and John McKnight. And they talk about a, a situation in which a, a young, young person is, is kind of floundering, he's having trouble in school, he's not connecting, and his mom is really worried about him. And, and one day when this young guy is walking down the street, he sees that one of his neighbors has a metal shop in the garage. And he goes and talks to him about it and asks what's going on. And pretty soon he's, he's apprenticing, essentially, with this guy. He's helping him out and he's learning metal work. And, and suddenly he feels, he feels somehow that he can do something. And so the mom's starting to talk to some of the other moms whose kids are likewise floundering. And they say, you know what, I bet there's other skills in this community that we don't know about. And they start doing a survey. They go door to door and find out what do the parents, what do the men know? What do the women know? And what, could they, what are they willing to share? And I'll give you the um, quick version of the summary. They, they found that people had juggling, barbecuing, bookkeeping, hunting, haircutting, bowling, crime investigation, poetry writing, fixing cars, choral singing, teaching dogs tricks, math, praying, how to drum, how to play the trumpet and the saxophone. So they had an inventory now of all these skills and they matched up those skills with some of the young people who wanted to learn those things. And of course, then they started discovering that of course the young people had skills as well that they could teach the elders. So these couple of moms basically provided, provided a matchmaking service between young people in the community and adults in the community. And what they found was that all these people had so much to share and loved sharing it, right? I mean, it's so much fun when you have a skill that you can share with a young person who, who's really eager to, to learn it. And that's often not your own kids, right? It's often somebody else's kids. <laughs> so when you actually make those linkages, you start unleashing this enormous wealth that was hidden in the community and is now available. So we can reweave those connections. We can build networks of love and support. And those are enormously important, especially during hard times. So another thing we can do, we can build economic and social equity. And this is one of the reasons I'm thrilled to be here in the, in the land of the Schumacher New Economy Institute, which has been one of my inspirations since, uh, since I first heard about land trusts and new economy ideas. In fact, my dad was a friend of Bob Swan, so this goes way back. 
Um, so we know that, that we know that economic well-being, that security and equity are foundations for happiness. So how do we do that? Well, at Yes Magazine and the Schumacher Institute, we, we look at a lot at what, what that new economy can, can be comprised of. We look at things like the, the credit union in, in Vancouver, British Columbia, Van City, which is an enormous credit union. It's millions, maybe billions in, in assets. And they've decided to use that as, the assets of their members' deposits to invest in the local community and especially to invest in the most impoverished parts of the local community so people have an opportunity to start the businesses that can actually jumpstart the economy. Another example, the Bank of North Dakota, the only state-run bank in the country, they take the deposits of the state, the deposits that the state government needs a place to put, instead of them putting it in a Wall Street bank where that money then goes to play on the global casino, they put it in the state bank and the state bank partners with local community banks and invests in local businesses and local farmers. When that bank makes a profit, which they inevitably do, the profits go back into the state coffer and the tax rate in North Dakota is very low. So they have a combination of a very strong economy built up of locally based businesses with a low tax rate. And not only because of the oil. We talk about things like the cooperative movement which is just taking off. It's so exciting to see how many young people are, are building worker-owned cooperatives. One of our favorite stories is out of Cleveland, Ohio, where the local hospital, local university, realized that they were sitting in the middle of a sea of poverty, right? They had these very well-funded institutions, but all around were impoverished, unemployed people. So they worked with the local foundation to start worker-owned co-ops that could supply things that they needed. For example, they started a worker-owned co-op to provide the laundry services that the hospital needs. So that means that those people now have living wage jobs. They're also their own worker owners, so they're also building equity, which means they'll be able to put their children through college and retire someday. It means they have opportunities to move into management and learn how the whole organization works. It means they have security because the hospital basically says, yeah, we're going to buy this service from you so we know you'll have a future here. And now they've started other co-ops, one that's providing solar energy, because again, the hospitals and the universities need electricity. So they, they rent the roofs of some of these institutions, put solar panels up there, and sell them the electricity. And another, another co-op is providing fresh fruits and vegetables year round by building these huge greenhouses and selling the vegetables to these same institutions, getting people fresh local produce, and at the same time, living wage jobs. So that's that whole notion of anchor institutions, how universities, how well-established institutions can partner to create worker co-ops is a whole other area where the, where the co-op movement's really taking off. So in all these cases, what you see is the, the money is circulating locally and it's bringing people up from poverty. And it's also deeply democratic because the more you distribute the econo economic well-being, the economic um, institutions, the more democratic participation you have in the economy and the more foundation you have for a political democracy as well. And I don't know if you've seen this lately, but it, you know, with Cuba doing all this transition from their old economy, which was really stuck, it was way too top down, people could not start the businesses that they wanted, Cuba has now started getting into to encouraging cooperatives. So I recently saw a press conference with the National Cooperative Business Association who is deeply involved in helping those co-ops in Cuba get started. So it's really interesting to see from the you know, so-called communist side as well as from our side in the United States, this deep interest in the cooperative movement as a way to get a co uh, an economy going that benefits everybody. Not so much in China and Russia, which are still really top down. <laughs> they made a very easy transition from authoritarian communism to authoritarian capitalism. But for the countries, for the places where there's real interest in democracy, cooperatives are a great model. Fifth thing we can do is value the gifts that everyone brings. Because each one of us is unique and each one of us has something to offer to the larger whole. I think in the introduction, Jennifer mentioned that I, I live on an Indian reservation, and one of the things I'm privileged to do is I go every year on the tribal canoe journey where each tribe, each tribe's young people especially, but, but people of all ages, 
go in hand-carved canoes from reservation to reservation, holding celebrations and ceremonies all along the way. And as we moved closer and closer to the destinations, the numbers increase until there's thousands of people gathered at the final destination point. And I'm not native, but I've been privileged to be part of this uh, journey for the last three years. And so it's been, a, it's been just an amazing learning experience for me. And one of the things I've noticed is that the things that, the skills that I might have in my world are not necessarily as valuable out on the water. I mean, I can, I can paddle, but it's the guy who knows how to go down into the engine room of the support boat with a piece of hose and put out the fire, breathing through the hose while he's doing it. He's the guy who's, who we really rely on. And it's the person who can rally everybody together and get them all paddling in, in uh, step with each other together and sing the songs and do the chants. Those are the people who are real valuable and the people who will keep paddling no matter how hard and how hot and how tired we all are and provide that as a model. Those are the people that are the most valuable. So in every different situation, different kinds of skills and different gifts come to the fore. And it's been so interesting for me to see that because in other parts of mainstream society, a lot of the people in these canoes are considered the outcasts. So if we have a society where we can value everybody's gifts, not only the ones who can go to college or who thrive in a classroom, but every gift. I saw something that I just loved on Facebook and I, I reposted it. It was something about how not everyone does well on standardized tests because we don't all have standardized minds. <laughs> so, so let's think about how we, how we value each other and how we, how we function in terms of our education. And the last thing, of course, is that we protect the natural world. That is such a key part of happiness. It's a key place that we get nourished spiritually. It's key to our survival. The native people, of course, have talked for years about the seventh generation rule, right? We don't do anything without thinking about the implications for the seventh generation ahead, which is a very different mindset than thinking about next quarter's financial returns. We can adopt the seventh generation rule. Another one is the humility to realize that when we take apart the web of life, we don't necessarily know how to put it back together again. So I think we're at a time when we're really reconnecting with how complex and how resilient the natural world is and how, much it, how critical it is to our survival and our well-being. And yet we're still not at the point where we would know how to. It's just, it's so interesting. If you just take one, one species, it's on the endangered species list, and you look at how hard it is to protect it and reintroduce it, and reintroduce it once it's gotten below a certain level of population. It is incredibly difficult. But the web of life is so much more complex than that. And, and most of the species that are out there, that are in the soil, that are in the ocean, we don't even, haven't even identified them, much less understand how they function. Or the ones in our bodies, there's something like 10 times as many cells that, belong, that are other critters, bacteria and various other kinds of organisms in our bodies, 10 times as many that are not us as there are us. And that ecosystem in our bodies is what also brings about our well-being. We don't understand that very well. We need to be a little bit humble and say, you know what, it's working. Let's try to protect it so it continues to work. <laughs> So these are all things that are within reach. Sustainable happiness doesn't mean we will always be giggly and joyful and, and uh, you know, fluffy puppies and all that kind of stuff. That's not what it means. Because life is, in fact, full of hardship. It's full of sadness when someone passes away. In fact, if we don't love people, we wouldn't feel that kind of sadness when we lose somebody. That's just part of life is to be sad, to feel that kind of grief. But we can create a foundation for well-being, a kind of well-being that's, that's deeply shared, that many people can be part of. And what happens? What kind of a world do we create when we do that? Well, I, one of the things that I found really interesting, and this, is, this was not originally going to be part of the book. the book. The book we did, by the way, was built on 
18 years of doing articles about happiness at Yes Magazine. Our very first issue was called Getting Free, Moving Beyond the Consumer Culture. So we have been looking at this question for years. And so when we decided to do this book, we pulled together articles our very favorite articles, the little team of us, and there was over a hundred of them. And then we had to winnow it down to our very, very, very favorite articles. And then when we had done that, our publisher said, you know what, you, you, you need to end it with another piece, which is what difference does it make? Suppose you do succeed in decolonizing happiness. If people reclaim happiness, what difference does it make, not only to them, but to the whole society? So we started thinking about that one, and one of the original pieces we wrote was about that question. So when we free ourselves from our identity as consumers, we no longer have to feel like failures if we're not living the lifestyle of the top 0.1%, right? Because that's the message we get now. If, you're not, if you don't have that fancy car, if you don't have all that fancy stuff, you're a failure. We can let go of that. And we can free ourselves from grasping for something that we know won't bring us happiness. We can make time for what counts. When we're out of that work and debt cycle, we have time for the other things, the things we talked about, that like friend, time with friends and children and elders and a spiritual life, for creative endeavors, for cooking dinners for our families, for growing food, for making things, for saving the world. When we let go of that view of happiness, we also can withdraw our support for this notion of perpetual economic growth, which is so destructive to the planet we can start reorienting our lives and our society around the notion of enoughness, around the notion of sufficiency. That means that we have to share the work, we have to share the resources so there's enough to go around. We can't say the people who are now precarious just have to fall off the bottom. We have to find a way to distribute fairly what we have. We also win ourselves some freedom. You know, it's interesting that the, uh, the original Declaration of Independence, the original draft said, talked about the right to pursue life, liberty, and property. And Thomas Jefferson was the one who changed it to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happy happiness. And it's interesting to think about what he meant by that. Some of the things I've read suggest that he was a, uh, a fan of the Greek notion of eudaimonia, which is a notion of happiness that's not sort of a fleeting pleasure, but is a deeper sense of living in dignity. So perhaps that's what he had in mind, that, 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 that we, what we would be pursuing is life, liberty, and dignity. And free people are more powerful. People who are not in debt to the corporate world are more powerful citizens. We can make our own choices about the kind of world we want. We can spend the time creating it. We can feel more powerful as citizens. We can strengthen our networks of security. And I think that's going to be increasingly important as our world gets more tumultuous. We're going to need to rely on one another, whether it's economic problems, whether it's problems created by the climate, whether it's any kind of, of breakdown in, in the way things have been going. I think we're going to need to turn to one another, not turn on one another. And if we've built those skills of community and built the networks of relationships, we have a much better chance of being able to do that. And we can protect the web of life because we no longer need to draw so many of those natural resources out of the planet in order to support what we think is going to make us happy. So, Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you will join me in an effort to reclaim happiness, to decolonize happiness, to make happiness something we create and we define that we don't allow to be defined for us. And I think in difficult times, that notion of happiness is what can get us through and what can give us the resources to build the kind of world that we really want. So thank you all very much.